Bonjour, I am very happy to be with you today. And first of all, thanks to uh, Muriel and Hervé, the RED organizers, and thanks to Laurence and his team and her team uh, behind the camera. Um, I am Jacques Arnoux, the uh, ethics advisor of CNES. And uh, what means ethics advisor at CNES? In fact, it's having the opportunity to, to be with you today and uh, trying to introduce some inter interrogation concerning the little green man, or more seriously, astrobiology. Um, astrobiology uh, is not an innocent science. I read uh, a very interesting story concerning primatologists. In the life of uh, a primatologist, a young uh, scientist, uh, it's a real important ordeal at the beginning of his job. It's a time uh, when he must look a monkey face to face and decide if whether or not to continue uh, his research. Because in the, he, he understands that if he continue to try to know more about uh, primates, he learn more things concerning uh, humankind and especially uh, himself, pleasant or unpleasant. And for me, it's the same for astrobiology. In, a, in the life of a young or probably older astrobiologist, arrive a time where searching for extraterrestrial life uh, introduce more and more interrogation concerning life, concerning life on Earth, and perhaps concerning human life and personal life. And we have to decide to go, to go forward or not. And ethics in astrobiology is the origin and the consequence of this situation. First, we have to um, begin before the space age. Before the space age, the official and common uh, way to name extraterrestrial life or astrobiology was um, another expression, plurality of words. And plurality of words was, in fact, different question. First question is a philosophical question. Uh, Albertus Magnus, a philosopher of the Middle Age, explains that this question of plurality of words is one of the most marvelous and noble questions in nature. In fact, behind the question of the existence or inexistence of other worlds and perhaps other form of life, Behind this in the existence or inexistence were different philosophical conceptions of the reality. If you have the idea of a unique world, of life only on Earth, in fact, this view is coherent with a cosmic vision of the reality. What I mean by cosmic vision is the fact that you are existing in a cosmos, and cosmos is a perfect, organized, and determined reality, without contingency, without chaos. And in the center of this cosmos, you have Earth, and on Earth, human life, and perhaps other form of life. This view was the most classic view not only in Greek philosophy, but also in the Occidental philosophy during a long time. The father of this view was, was Aristoteles. Another way to think was being ready to have other form of life on other planets, other worlds, a plurality of worlds. And in this case, this conception, this cosmological conception, is linked with the possibility of contingency, of chaos. A very nice summary of this situation and the controversy 
was given during the Middle Age by, the, by Thomas Aquinas. He explains that only those who don't recognize any orderly wisdom, but who believe in chance, can assert the existence of several words, like Democritus, who say that this word, alongside countless other words, was a product of a chance encounter of atoms. Democritus was an atomist philosopher. You can understand that at this time and until the modern time, plurality of words was a very debated philosophical question, not directly scientific question. This question was also a theological question, only a very brief time concerning this point. And the question was very easy. Can the divinity, can God create other intelligent beings than humans, especially than me? In fact, geocentrism, remember the Copernican revolution, geocentrism and anthropocentrism are linked. Some of us, some of our ancestors, have real difficulty to admit the idea not being unique. I give the name of this difficulty, the name of elder syndrome. We can prefer to be the unique child of our parents. The arrival of a little brother or little sister is a real catastrophe. And it was the idea of, the, of most of theological tradition linked with this elder syndrome. We are unique, unique child, children of our divine parents, divine father. On the contrary, if we are accepting the idea of other brother and sister, perhaps this idea of plurality introduce, influence our self-awareness and perhaps our ethics. After being a philosophical and a theological question, the question of plurality of words is also a scientific question. I mean science in the sense of uh, all time. Um, I give in my, one of the previous um, uh, picture the, uh, the cover of a book of Fontenelle. Fontenelle is a French scientist and philosopher. And he wrote a very interesting book, book concerning the conversation about the plurality of words. Fontenelle was not only the writer, he was also a scientist, and he was the uh, perpetual secretary of the Academy of Science in Paris at the beginning of the 17th century. And it's very interesting. It means that this question of plurality of words was at this time, or began at this time, to be a scientific question. But without concrete observation and only very far astronomical uh, observation. But the same Academy of Science in Paris, now at the end of the 19th century, um, created a prize to encourage communication with extraterrestrial societies. Um, very interesting because the Moon and Mars was outside this prize, outside this challenge, because at this time it was very clear that it, it would be easy to communicate with people on the Moon and on Mars. It was not a scientific position, but a position linked with a scientific organization. Priority of war was also a scientific question at the same time with a famous affair of the uh, Mars canals and Percival Lowell and observation of this very strange figure on Mars uh, of the right planets. You, everybody knows this debate. It was perhaps more an epistemological question than a scientific question. Uh, what is the difference between the reality and what we observe of the reality? It's probably the the main lesson of this debate at the end of the 19th century concerning the canals of Mars. 
After being a philosophical, theological and scientific question, plurality of world is also a, a, a question or a, a main subject for literary and science fiction. Uh, you have so many examples uh, before the space age and perhaps the main uh, example is the war, the war of Worlds, um, written by Wales at the end of the 19th century at the same time as a prize uh, created by the uh, Academy of Science in Paris. But after that, and you know, during the space age and I arrive at this time, uh, you have uh, so many example of science fiction books and creation um, only two examples uh, Andromeda Strain by Michael Crichton or Mars Trilogy link with some ethical question so it was before the space age and we have to arrive at the space age by the, the famous uh, Sputnik launch uh, it could be a very uh, De, in the agenda, a very good time to introduce the space age. Um, and with this, uh, with this time, we have a modification, an evolution. We don't speak today uh, about the plurality of worlds, inhabited or not. We are speaking about exobiology and astrobiology. Uh, one of the most uh, in interesting writer in history of science, uh, Stephen Dick, explained uh, that exobiology don't exist either in name or substance before the dawn of the space age, and that's correct. Uh, at the same time, um, you can use the denomination you want, uh, exobiology, astrobiology, or even plurality of words, uh, we have to recognize that this question uh, is probably the last avatar of a very old question of the other. Uh, who, where, which are easy possible other of my own, uh, different of me, different of our sp human species. It's a very, very old question. Sometimes I explain that this question of the other, of the alien, of the alter, alter ego, perhaps, uh, is not only one of the most, most old question, but uh, this question follows us as our shadow. We cannot avoid uh, this question every day, everywhere. And exobiology, astrobiology, uh, give us uh, the opportunity one more time to ask this question and perhaps trying to, pro to provide some answers. Um, it's really um, an, a question linked with exploration. When we explore, we have to go outside our own personality, our own identity, our own common uh, territory. And it's exploration, it's the occasion perhaps uh, to go to the uh, to encounter other people from our species, other uh, life, other form of life, and perhaps in the future extraterrestrial life. So it's a very interesting philosophical question. Um, but this question is very specific. Um, everybody knows there is a, ve is a very famous sentence, perhaps for Martin Rees, the, the British astronomer, or perhaps from Carl Sagan, I don't know, we, I have these two possibilities. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And by this sentence, we are introduced in the uh, specificity, specificity of this question. Until now, uh, after 60 or perhaps more years of research in official exobiology and astrobiology, uh, we don't have any clear evidence of the existence of all other form of life or form of life on other planets around us. Uh, it's open. We have a lot of data, a lot of uh, hypotheses. Uh, we can calculate probabilities and you, you, you are able now to do that with, uh, with people ar around you in the astrobiological domain. But in fact, uh, until now, 
the only issue is to have a positive answer. We, uh, and uh, we, are, we are hoping to have that in, in the, the nearest future. Uh, we are waiting on this positive answer. But we never obtain a definitive uh, negative answer. That's a very specific situation of the uh, astrobiological question. So we have to remain until now open to a positive, uh, positive answer and, and to know that we never add the negative. It's a very interesting situation and we are not very perhaps ready to admit that. Okay, we will see the future. Connected with this um, question, with this domain of astrobiology, we have a lot of very interesting philosophical questions. You know every of these questions. What, first, what is life? It's a scientific question, but not, all, not only a scientific question, it's also a philosophical question. Perhaps remember the, the sentence of Albertus Magnus, uh, one of the most marvelous and noble and difficult question in the nature and concerning nature. What is life? Try to offer your own answer to that. Um, related with what is life is what is the value of life? Uh, we, and in our topic of astrobiology, we have some very um, specific questions. Um, for example, and I try to answer or to give some answer uh, further, uh, how far can we go in the research for knowledge concerning another life when the existence of the researcher, of the explorer, and perhaps of all humankind is in danger? Another question is, can we colonize a planet on which we would have discovered traces of life, alien life, present or even past. Other philosophical question is, is it possible to establish principles, uh, moral, ethics, when we are in situation of uh, ignorance? And at least is a question of relativism. Um, we can organize, uh, elaborate human ethics, but what is concerning alien ethics? Uh, we know that we have different ways to, um, to evaluate life, the quality of life, the, uh, and I give some example uh, of, this, uh, of this view, um, but if you introduce the possibility of alien life, it's more complicated. Okay, but now the, the story is uh, that nine months and we are introducing a, a very interesting, it's, it's the first, uh, how planetary protection was introduced. And it was by moon dust. Nine months after uh, the Sputnik flight, um, two scientists, two American scientists, Joshua Lederberg and Dean Cowie, published uh, an article, Moon Dust, in which they alert a scientist about the danger of contamination. At this time, just in 1958, um, researching the origin of life uh, was a, the, new, the new world, the new frontier. And at this time, even moon dust could provide some uh, priceless secrets. So sending rockets on the moon, on the surface of the moon, means uh, mechanical, physical, chemical, and perhaps biological contamination. And in the, by this way, destroying perhaps some very precious data. And uh, it's what we name today forward contamination. You know that. And it was necessary to avoid that. Uh, in the name of uh, the future science and the future astrobiological uh, science. And uh, the, the impact of this article was, was great. And especially the young NASA. Uh, and NASA decided to introduce 
uh, rules, uh, procedures concerning uh, planetary protection. It was a, the, the birth of what we name today planetary, pro planetary protection and connect with that uh, officer or planetary protection officer. It's very interesting because moon dust uh, remain uh, at the uh, always interesting 10 years after at the, uh, during the Apollo mission. And we, you know that uh, at this time, uh, the question of contamination was always very important for the uh, NASA teams. And the, uh, the Apollo uh, crew coming back from the moon, uh, 11, uh, 12, and 14 mission, were uh, in quarantine due to uh, uh, concerning contamination forward contamination, uh, but backward contamination also. How to protect um, man, but also um, moon rocks from contamination. So um, a, a way to illustrate, another way to illustrate the fact that moon dust was at the center of the, uh, of the uh, interest at this time. Now it's no more the case because after some research, we know that it was no risk of, of uh, uh, backward contamination and only the, the, the stones have to be protected. Another example of this time, I suppose it's very famous among you, uh, is the, uh, the Surveyor 3 uh, case. And uh, this, uh, this time during which we people think that perhaps we are uh, uh, bring back to, to Earth some uh, p life being uh, after they uh, journeyed to the moon, on the moon, and back to Earth. But it was more a sort of uh, uh, dirty little secret, as named uh, one of the uh, pro planetary protection officers from NASA, due to the, a lack of uh, protection in some NASA lab. Um, but uh, by this example, we can introduce some very interesting uh, principle and idea concerning uh, planetary protection. First, to preserve the uh, scientific uh, integrity, we have to introduce what we name in other domain precautionary principle. Perhaps you know that this uh, precautionary principle was introduced now 30 years ago during the Rio de Janeiro conference and um, one of the definitions of this principle is the following. Where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty shall not, not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measure to prevent environmental degradation. And it's a very interesting principle for us in astrobiology. I'm not debating the question of the application of this principle on Earth. And you know that there's a lot of debate around this precautionary principle. But uh, for astrobiology, it's very, very interesting because we are in a domain of research. So we have to manage ignorance. We have to manage this lack of full scientific certainty. And how to manage that? We have to avoid the contamination of extraterrestrial environment, extraterrestrial samples. It's more concerning forward contamination, but also uh, Earth, also our human species is backward contamination. So we have to apply this precautionary principle without hesitation, and it's probably in my opinion, uh, something belonging to the uh, astrobiological research and how to manage that by ethical uh, attitude or position. Precautionary pr principle, but also another principle, responsibility principle. Uh, this principle was introduced by, the, by a, a German philosopher, Hans Jonas, uh, during the 19th, and uh, Again, this, uh, this, the definition given by Jonas himself is very interesting. Um, 
act so that, that the effect of your action are compatible with the permanence of an authentic human life on Earth. This principle is probably more for us to link with uh, backward contamination. But we have a lot of examples, or a lot, but probably not until now, but example now and in the future, where we have to, to think about this principle. Remember the Genesis uh, mission a few years ago, and the uh, not catastrophic, but accidental return to Earth. And in this case, there was no uh, damage uh, for uh, life on Earth. But in case of a little green men were on board of this uh, probe, it could be perhaps dangerous. Remember the Michael Crichton essay uh, and, um, uh, I mentioned before. So um, responsibility principle is for me another very interesting principle for ethical reflection in astrobiology. And a very good example of, of, this, of the application of these two principles uh, when we are going uh, to Mars and beyond is the, um, the recommendation elaborated by COSPAR, the uh, international, international Organization. And um, in this recommendation, COSPAR proposed uh, a global protection, uh, especially in case of forward contamination, how to manage our exploration mission to protect the extraterrestrial uh, environment linked with a level of knowledge or the level of ignorance uh, we, we have concerning this extraterrestrial um, context, planet, uh, or other environment. But um, all these recommendations are very interesting. You, are, you, are, you, are, you know this recommendation, you are probably working with them. But at the same time, we have to admit that it's not enough. It's not enough to, to manage the future, especially because we are in a situation of a lack of knowledge, a situation of ignorance, and how to manage especially the risk in the future. Um, one way to try to uh, to think about this, the future is to, to ask the following question. Will astronauts be regarded as samples? It's until now an uh, example, because remember the case of Apollo mission, there's no real risk, and, and the, the management was good at this time, I mean with uh, a possible contamination. Um, but um, in the case of future mission on other planets, yes, we can have the, the, the situation of contaminate, contamination of the astronaut. Sure that the uh, exploration, as I mentioned before, exploration going outside our common way of life, our dom common domain of life, uh, is always risky. But in the case of um, astrobiology, we have a very specific situation. In the case of contamination of astronaut, and we know today this situation of uh, of contamination in our pandemic situation. Uh, when you are contaminated, you became immediately, or <laughs> after a few time, contaminating agent. From contaminated to contaminating. And that's a challenge. Um, you, and it's connecting with what we name forward or backward contamination. Um, it's not easy, it's never easy to break the chain of contamination um, in general, but especially in our situation of, I, I use this example of astronauts, uh, because it's human being. And if you ask engineer, they explain uh, you hold the situation in the exploration mission uh, and 
uh, arriving on Mars, on another planet, and uh, how it's quite impossible to avoid that, and to avoid the situation of from being contaminated to uh, becoming contaminating. And so the question is, is real. I mean, we have to ask this question when we are preparing mission in the future. And in this case, we have to, the first question is how we have to consider uh, astronauts, uh, contaminated and contaminating astronauts. Uh, I have no time and to, intru to introduce in the, at this, uh, this uh, time the, the question of the uh, legal statue uh, of astronaut. You know that uh, officially and legally, astronaut had envoys, uh, messenger of humankind as the official position. Okay, but in case of, cont of contamination, uh, you have not to ignore that but you have to introduce this official position in a very concrete situation of contamination. And uh, what we can uh, do, what we can decide for this astronaut, uh, how first to evaluate the risk, uh, how to, uh, what sort of procedure we have to introduce before contamination. I mean, for example, when they come back to Earth, what sort of procedures, what sort of analysis, uh, measure, and what sort of decision. Um, in fact, we uh, don't have until now a very concrete idea. Uh, we can elaborate precise observation, we can prepare a uh, ground tie, we can perhaps prepare some sort of vaccination, uh, and in case of contamination, but the future uh, is not an easy question. Uh, if we have the idea of a high level of risk, uh, and even if we don't have a uh, concrete idea, what is the danger? Um, it's a question of responsibility, even if they are volunteer to be explored, to go to another planet, but we have a responsibility concerning this, this explorer. We have a responsibility not only concerning this astronaut, but the connection between this astronaut and our humankind. Uh, and it's not only a question of uh, individual situation, but a global situation. And we know that we are not until now really ready, ready to find, uh, to decide, to, to answer, to, to give a concrete decision. But it's a very uh, interest, interesting situation and, and I hope that in the future we have concrete debate concerning that. And perhaps after uh, this period of uh, pandemia, we have new ideas concerning the relation between uh, individual situation, uh, between the individual person and the, the society, the, the collective dimension. Um, we can wait perhaps more, more, some several months and introduce that. It, it could be very, very interesting. But again, um, I repeat, what sort of measure we can introduce to detect, to assess, to manage the risk, and what sort of procedure we can introduce uh, to a solution, vaccination, uh, uh, quarantine or, or perhaps in, in a, a very bad situation form of euthanasia. We know that uh, out and the, at this situation out we can combine a context of uh, very um, lethal or bad situation and a situation of urgency and, and the free the free consent of, of people. Um, a very uh, a huge question. But by this way, and we have, uh, by this way, we have to, to remember uh, the story of humankind, the story of exploration, the story of colonization, the story of the discovery of, of the new world a few centuries ago, and the consequence for the people uh, in the two sides of the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Not easy, but remember uh, what we know or what we ignore concerning this time, 
perhaps we have another uh, or but the same chapter in the future and we have probably to prepare that um, in the same time we're preparing the scientific exploration of our uh, cosmos and our um, especially our astrobiological mission but zero risk don't exist never forget that and especially when we are trying to explore the unknown. Remember, I asked two sort of questions uh, at the beginning of my talk, and one of the questions was concerning the colonization of uh, other planets. I know that it's not directly linked with uh, astrobiology, but in the head of our um, uh, of people around, around us, uh, it's a, a real connection. And it's what sort of attitude we, we have to, to elaborate and to decide when we discover a form of life, present of pa or past, uh, in another, or on another planet. And um, remember what we can read on Earth during the first mission of, uh, to Mars, during the 60s and, and 70s. I, it's very interesting, uh, especially the difference between uh, red and green. Uh, at this time, the red uh, opinion uh, was protection of Mars. If we find some trace of life on Mars, I repeat, present or past, we have to sanctuarize Mars. It was a red attitude because Mars has to, to stay red. Uh, life uh, is sacred and we have to sanctuarize Mars or, or another planet. Uh, the green position was the opposite position. Okay, uh, perhaps it was life on Mars in the past or now, uh, but we are arriving the first. Uh, Martian life don't arrive first on, on, on Earth, so we, uh, we can colonize Mars. And it's a green position because arriving with our, uh, not only automatic probe, but with our uh, human crew, it's a, okay, a way to green Mars. Um, it's more a sort of, yes, perhaps life is sacred, but struggle for life is the, uh, the rule, the Darwinian, the Darwinian rule. So, uh, okay, we, we can go and, and colonize our life on Mars. Um, it was a, the, uh, the debate uh, 40 years ago. Today, perhaps our attitude is, is, could be some, a little different. A few years ago, NASA scientists published a very interesting um, essay or, or, or article um, named Ethical exploration and the rule of planetary protection in disrupting colonial practices. Uh, so probably the green attitude was a more colonial uh, attitude, okay? Uh, but it's um, uh, how to think differently. It's, it's a very interesting study. Uh, so we, we have to think about that. What sort of attitude we, are, we decide to promote concerning an hypothetical life on Mars or beyond Mars. Um, again, we don't have definitive and official uh, position. But don't forget the um, uh, very interesting legal principle introduced by the Space Treaty uh, 50 years ago. Um, this idea of common heritage of mankind. You probably know this principle, this legal principle. It's a very interesting principle. Uh, normally, uh, we said, okay, common heritage of mankind means a sort of appropriation, uh, heritage of mankind. And some people say, it's totally stupid. What sort of hubris coming from humankind saying, uh, space is our common heritage. You can interpret this uh, principle by this way. And in this case, it's a very anthropocentric and incredible excessive uh, um, pretension. 
But my interpretation of, of this uh, legal principle is more uh, linked with the uh, responsibility principle. Uh, remember, for Ancionas, this uh, principle was linked with human life on Earth, but we can apply this uh, principle, responsibility principle, on another planet. And when we say, by the space treaty, that space is our common heritage, we don't say that it's our um, it's not a way of, to appropriate space. It's, space is not our property, but space is our responsibility. Uh, we don't know if extraterrestrial life exists or not, but by introducing this um, principle of common heritage, for me, we are deciding or we are accepting that space space we explore, space we discover, uh, is under our responsibility. And we have to, to uh, manage our decision, our attitude, our um, action uh, with a real um, interest uh, or and a real interest for responsibility. And remember, uh, Ancionas was linked how to protect life and human life on Earth. It could be how to protect reasonably life on other planets. So that's a way uh, we have now to probably to, uh, to think, to prepare uh, the future of uh, exploration. Because exobiology or astrobiology as you want, uh, it's, it's a good occasion, a very nice opportunity to, to reignite um, the essence of exploration. I, I mentioned that at the beginning of my talk. Exploration uh, belongs to our human essence, going outside our uh, uh, identity, our frontiers, our knowledge, our certain certainties, and Okay, exploration, it's my opinion, belong to our essence. And astrobiology, uh, trying to find other form of life, uh, perhaps intelligent life, it's an incredible opportunity to promote this, this spirit of exploration. So it's not only a, a scientific issue, it's not only a technical issue, it's also an incredible uh, interesting philosophical opportunity. Um, when I began my work as ethics advisor in CNES, I tried to find some uh, previous work in this domain. I don't find a lot of books. And one of these books was very, very interesting. It was an essay written by a German philosopher in 1960 just at the beginning of the space age. And the title of this book was um, uh, Is the Sky Open to Us? Is the Sky Open to Us? Uh, an open question, just at the beginning of the space age. And this philosopher was not pro or against space exploration. He tried to think about what is the consequence for Earth coming from space exploration, and what is the condition to explore space. And he reintroduced a very old sentence coming from um, Socrates, know yourself, and after you discover the world around you and perhaps other form of life. And I think that's the first consequence and concrete consequence today uh, of astrobiology on philosophy and ethics is the necessity to know b better and better concerning our own human condition. And that's the reason astrobiology is the same, it's so fascinating. It's a fascinating domain. And astrobiology fascinates people perhaps 
probably you, but also people around, uh, around us. Because it's always the occasion to think about myself, who I am, who I, I decide to be. It's not easy because you always arrive at very sensitive questions. Remember my question, what do we have to do if tomorrow astronaut became contaminated and contaminating agent force? We decide to kill them or what? We don't have answer. But I know that trying to give some answer to this sort of question is a way to progress in our own humankind. That's the reason uh, we have to, to, go co to go forward in astrobiological research. And that's the reason you are today at the RED session. Thank you for your attention.